A very good afternoon to all. I take immense pleasure in welcoming all of you to this exclusive webinar on exploring values and belief through the lens of cross-cultural psychology. I am Sunilesh Batabyal, a second year student pursuing BSc Data Science and Economics and your host for today. Do you often contemplate the diverse values and belief that exist among individuals? Have you ever wondered about the origins of these beliefs and how they shape our perspectives? Understanding psychology requires unraveling these integrate details and exploring the fascinating differences that make up the tapestry of humanity. By delving into the complexities of individuals, we can gain a deeper understanding of how our shared experiences and appreciate the beauty of our diversity. To address the same, today's session will be taken by Professor Moitre Das, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Flame University. She received her PhD and MPhil degree in management and labor studies from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She has also completed an executive postgraduate diploma in analytics from TISS Mumbai, that is TISS Mumbai. She holds an MA degree in applied psychology with a specialization in industrial psychology and a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Mumbai. Besides teaching, Professor Moitre has a keen interest in research and has several publications to her credit in the area of OB, Organizational Behavior and HR, Human Resource and related domains. I'm sure we all are going to have a very enriching session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you uh, so much. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Sunilish. Very uh, kind of you to say that. Uh, before I start the session, should we have that poll to understand the participants and the listeners for today? Absolutely, ma'am. Great. We have the poll live now. All right, yeah. It would be great if people are filling up. Yes, I can see uh, All 11 right. responses. A lot of students, a few educators. Yes. Excellent, excellent. I'm very excited and I hope you too. So great, great. A lot of students and educators we have here. Lovely. And I hope a few others would join in eventually. So hello, everyone. Like Sunilesh said, I am Dr. Moitri and I teach psychology at Flame University, Pune. The main idea for today's session is to take you all through the journey of cross-cultural psychology and help you understand how the values, beliefs, myths, stereotypes, superstition, stigmas, prejudices, discrimination are formed over time in human beings and how they are shaped up through our lives. The topic for today's session is exploring values and beliefs through the cross-cultural lens. Before I you know, go into the details of the session, I'll show you the first slide and I hope it will be relatable to most of you, mostly the students, I think. Is the second slide uh, visible to all? Yes, ma'am, it is visible to all. Okay, great. So you can see the common statements that people usually hear, right? Either you would have heard it yourself or you would have heard somebody else saying it or you may have said this to somebody in some time in your life. You're getting influenced by the Western culture. Is sushi even food? We have forgotten Indian values and Indian culture. Why haven't you touched XYZ's feet when you've come why are you wearing this or that or jeans for the puja? And so many more, right? The list goes on. Like if I had to keep writing all the things that you and I hear on a daily basis, the session would end, but the, you know, the statements wouldn't. This idea between, you know, you're getting influenced by the Western culture. You're forgetting the Indian culture. Why are you wearing this? Why are you listening to that? What is K-pop? What is BTS? What is K-music? And so many more, right? You would know it better than me. Primarily tells us that whoever is telling us all these, right? They are basically comparing our behavior or what we do or what we eat or what we listen to and what we watch to something outside. That something outside is primarily the West, the American culture, the US lifestyle, right? 
this comparison between what you were and what you've become how we are you know you hear a lot of people saying oh we are completely brainwashed by the west before we used to have such good songs but now look at the english songs look at these movies what does that even mean these comparison these doubts and these idea that what we are right now or the behavior that we display or the clothes that we wear or the food that we eat is not what used to be a long time back and these comparisons is primarily my dear listeners the crux of cross cultural psychology when somebody is telling you that you have forgotten indian values and indian culture or you are trying to quote and quote copy the western culture you're following the k drama you're following the k pop look at that music why do you not listen to you know indian traditional music and all of that there is a comparison being made between what they see of you right now as to what you wear what you eat what you listen to and what you are actually doing vis-a-vis -vis the west these comparisons of behavior of lifestyle of food habits across cultures across countries across states across two or more worlds is what cross cultural psychology exactly tries to study if there are no two cultures two state or two worlds there would be no cross cultural psychology the entire idea of this subject is understanding the similarities the differences and everything in between two cultures and two and more cultures right i thought that why not start off with this slide because i'm guessing right if maybe i'm wrong correct me if i'm wrong that this is something most of us would have heard either we would have heard we would have told but this is very familiar and i'm guessing the bts a music band and k pop is likely to be familiar with a lot of us here today this is a name game that uh, sunilesh is going to put out in the chat right now i want you all to take a minute dear listeners i want you to take a minute read the step 1 step 2 step 3 read what it says right and then at the end of the session during the q and a i want you to tell me what are your thoughts about the step 1 what are your thoughts about step 2 and what are your thoughts about step 3 this slide basically talks about how our names are given to us i don't think a lot of us or any of us rather would have the privilege of choosing our own names maybe not a lot of us few of us would have had that right so why are the names given to us as it is what do our names mean would they have the same value if we go to a different country are there cultural variations in the same name are the way our names pronounce the way the accent is held when our names are called out means the same thing in india and the same thing in egypt what does a name have to do william shakespeare in his very famous work had said what's in a name but you and me being in india as indians would know that there is so much in a name right there is so much stored in a name so i wanted to introduce this name game and you know tell you all to take a minute to read the step 1 step 2 step 3 and hopefully by the end of the session you can tell me your thoughts about this if you agree if you disagree and anything that you have to think all right so it's there on the chat box and you can then at the end of it we'll discuss okay moving on to the next slide right i like i already said cross cultural psychology i already made a brief introduction to the session the crux of cross cultural psychology is comparisons the crux of cross cultural psychology is understanding the similarities and differences between two and more cultures i have two very good good friends dear listeners one friend is from uttar pradesh and the other friend is from kerala we have been friends since school time right and i am from assam so i am from assam and my two other very close friends are from uttar pradesh and kerala i remember in my college days you know when i was doing my bachelors and masters i remember that this to crack a lot of jokes right on different kind of jokes and my friends would tell each other oh you know what moitri this joke is very funny here probably in assam but if you come to kerala this joke would not sit right it would be offensive and the same thing my friend from up would tell me moitri maybe you are cracking this joke here but something out there would not be 
considered okay it would not be considered as a joke it would be taken an offense and vice versa between the three of us of course at that time i did not give it much thought but as i climbed up my educational ladder and started thinking about what this means why is a joke that is funny for me can be taken as a reference for someone else what does it mean that you know in assam you people may find this funny but x in xyz state that joke may not sit well right now when i'm talking to you all i'm thinking about the, those jokes again and i can only imagine how not normalized and offensive those jokes could have been or are in different states because of the way people have grown up the way i grew up in my state with the resources that my family gave me with the privileges and comfort and luxury that i had is very different from somebody else's lifestyle in any other part of the country or state or world for me to think that the thought processes that i have grown up with my world view the way i look at the world the way i understand the world is going to be similar to every other person who has grown up in x y z state be it new york be it canada be it mumbai be it pune is absolutely wrong the idea that all of us have our world views have our knowledge based on how we grow up dear listeners we grow up we grew up probably with some comfort some luxury some privileges that somebody else in a different part of the world would not have grown up with is it fair to then expect that at this stage in life or at any stage in life when you meet you would think if i understand this why does not xyz understand this if i find it funny why does not xyz find it funny or anything for that matter because then you have to think and critically think where is the other person coming from have they been brought up with the same knowledge same level of schooling english medium schools with the teachers and the kind of teachers we had in their state in their country did they also get the comfort luxury and privileges that my parents offered me in their family all this little which is not little differences that is there between two people that is there between two states and two cultures and two country is exactly what cross cultural psychology tries to dive into in their unique study at the end of the slide you can see what's normalized here is not what's normalized elsewhere right for example in the us it may be quite common it may be popular for students for you who are closing to their 18 or 19 or 17 or 20 to start part time jobs to to do part time jobs or to move out from their family home to stay separately to have a part time job and do their education but it's not yet so common here in india it may be normal in the west to have certain kind of alcoholic semi alcoholic beverages at a comparatively younger age groups for their social gatherings and parties it's not so common here the curfews the time curfews for people to get back home in different age groups matters across cultures when we look at one story and say this is what it is we run the risk of generalization dear listeners and what do i mean by that i mean that if somebody had to come and do a study right let's say somebody wants to come and do a study in india to understand how is the gen z population right a lot of you here are part of the gen z population how does the gen z population view their future theek okay? hai we will imagine that a researcher is coming and doing a research and they want to understand how does the gen z population view their future view their career and how serious they are about their future and they would come sit and talk to the 50 of you or 100 of you let's say who are in the seminar for example 100 of you in the seminar and they would conduct a study with the 100 of you they would try and ask you what is your views about your future what do you want to become how serious are you for your career how motivated are you and 10 questions they would do the study with 100 of you then they would go out and publish a result saying that in today's times gen z population is extremely serious about the future and most of them want to become doctors is that right or is that wrong based on the 100 of you 
who are in the seminar, they would have done a survey and then they would have published a result saying that in 2023, the Gen Z population mostly are inclined towards going in the medical field and want to become doctors. Very, very wrong. Absolutely wrong. Why? Why is that so? Because this study was done only with the 100 of you. Right? It was, and you, where do each 100 of you come from? We have no idea. You could come from urban background, semi-urban background, rural background, semi-rural backgrounds. We don't know. The study was done in this place and time with 100 students who are from India and then generalized to explain that Gen Z global population has these thoughts of becoming medical. Somebody sitting in Egypt, somebody sitting in Kazakhstan would say, no, not at all. Why does this study try to generalize? We then run the risk of generalization. A study done on a small population in a different country when used for global knowledge runs the risk of generalization, which gives us extremely inaccurate and false information. That is why critical thinking, questioning everything before accepting anything, and always being inquis inquisitive about whatever comes up, whatever you hear, is very, very important, my dear listeners. Very, very important. If we quickly take up any information, accept it without questioning, don't use our own heads to critically think and start labeling people, start judging people based on that one piece of information you read. We run the risk of inaccurate judgments, labeling, and false shaming and blaming, which is something that we see today in our country, in our world, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That's why cross-cultural psychology means critical thinking runs in the blood of it. You got to think everything that you hear and know before you put a label on anything, anyone, right? This slide, yeah. This slide comes with an interesting poll, right? And Sunilesh will share the poll with you all before I move on to the sixth slide. Sunilesh, yeah, great. Yes, ma'am, the poll is live. Excellent. Yes, dear listeners, I'm waiting for your uh, answers, please. Excellent, excellent. A black cat crossing the road is a sign of bad luck. All of you said superstition. If you eat stale food, you could have an upset stomach. All of you said it's a fact. Excellent, dear listeners. You know that all the four pictures that you see in this slide are part of somebody or the other's superstitious belief. And they are not facts. Keep chili in front of your door. Buri nazar se bachenge. The black cat crossed the road. Stop for 10 minutes or else you're likely to meet with an accident. A glass has broken. Bad luck for seven years. Put this face with a nimbu and Bhagwan ka picture at the end of your truck or vehicle or somewhere. Then bad energy will not enter your space. This is something a lot of us, a lot of us do it. A lot of us. That is something I wanted to start. That's why uh -huh. I gave the poll. Ma'am, yeah. could you uh, repeat uh, your last part? I think we lost you in between. Okay. I was uh, Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Great. So, right now that all the four pictures that you can see is part of our superstitious belief. Right? It's all part of our superstitious belief. And that's why I shared that poll with you before I could start off with the next slide that is superstition and myths. Superstitious beliefs are beliefs that have no logic in true rational living. These beliefs are primarily based on people's logic, people's stories, and they try to make connection between events that are not related. Wear the lucky number seven for your match. You're likely to win it. Wear red for your interview. You will most likely get it. Don't wear yellow rubber band for your exam. You might fail. And the list goes on. And the list goes on. But you 
my dear listeners, have rightly said what is a superstition and what is a fact. If you eat stale food, you will have an upset stomach. That is a fact that does not change. Backed by science, backed by knowledge, backed by medical history. If a black cat crosses the road or if a glass breaks in front of you, you will have bad luck for seven years. It's a belief that is had. And there are multiple superstitious beliefs across cultures. I had a friend who had come and, uh, you know, back in college again when I was doing my master's. She had uh, come from Egypt, right, who was doing her master's when I was doing my master's. And she had said that... Uh, Ma'am, we lost you uh, again, ma'am. You will see, to the whole of the country. She told me, Moitri, in my family, if we take bath before one o'clock, right, if we take bath before one o'clock, we believe it's bad luck. So we take bath at a particular time between particular hours and then we go for any important work. And this practice has been going on in my family for the last 15 years. And then I laughed it off and I said something, some other belief that we have, superstition. And she said, really? And I remember us sharing, you know, superstitious beliefs from the ones that we follow in my family and the one that she follows in her family in Egypt. And this goes on across people, across cultures. If you run a random Google search, superstitious beliefs in US, superstitious beliefs in Egypt, in Bangladesh, in India, China, Pakistan, you will get multiple searches. Dear listeners, multiple searches based on what people believe. What does this tell us? This tells us that while what you believe may not make rational sense to you, right, or to somebody else, it is still someone's belief. It, it could be someone's even stronger value coming from their traditional history, from their past, from their ancestors, and that's why they are upholding it till now. That's what. What makes sense to you? does not need to make sense to somebody else when it comes to beliefs and myths. There is a very beautiful distinction between superstitions and myths. Myths come from stories, folklores that usually involve supernatural humans, fancied people. Somebody would have said that Sita crossed that road. In Ramayana, Sita crossed that road and she went to heaven. It's a myth. Right? So then the belief would be that anyone who crosses that road usually will go to heaven no matter how they live their life. life. So these kind of superstition and myths are something that guide us, not just us as people in India and Indians, but people across the world and across the cultures. And then you really got to stop and think, how many beliefs do we have as people that actually have no sense in rationality, that actually make no logical sense, but people still follow it. Devdat Patnayak, a very, very popular writer, mythological writer, writes on business, writes on management, writes on Indian uh, mythological stories and religious aspects, had said in an interview with Hindustan Times, fact is everybody's truth. Fiction is nobody's truth. Myth is somebody's truth. Right? What are the common myths that you hear? You can write down in the chat box for me, dear listeners. It would be great to see the myths that you hear day to day. Mental illness is a joke. Mental illness is a lie. Is a myth I hear every day, even among my family members, sometimes among my people that I work with, not here, that I used to work with in the past, and people that I usually talk to. Are you sure there's something called mental illness? Or this is just something you all are hyping it up in the new generation. So it would be great to see the kind of myths that you all hear because I'm sure we hear so many myths. Stories about menstruation. Right? If you Google search, what are the menstrual myths that need to be broken? If you are having your periods, if you're on your menstrual cycle, you must not wash your hair. Or a demon is likely to come at night. You should not use perfume. Or you're inviting a genie. You must not go out after 6 o'clock. You're inviting a bad spirit. If all of this, you're on your periods. 
and bath rituals something that i spoke about my friend in the past and other thing being that if you carry your towel not in your left hand but in your right hand while you're going for a bath that means that something unholy could happen that means that you know two hours after that you are likely to have a bad time and x y z i mean there is uncountable innumerable number of myths that people you and me would hear of and hear of daily right but very very important to talk of this in this cross cultural psychology session why to understand the people come from different levels of knowledge today me sitting here giving you this webinar right and you also come with the understanding a lot of you are writing interesting things in the chat that i can see don't step into the temple consider periods in your excellent ananya aditi and probably a lot of you are writing that that i will see by the end you know are aware of these myths but somebody who has not got the education that you and i have got somebody who has not got chances to sit in these seminars workshops and webinars that you and i have got somebody who has not got the privileges that you and i have got till date can i compare with them and say that oh my god you don't have to believe all that that does not make sense what are you saying without understanding where this person comes from without understanding that there is a difference between the source and type of knowledge we both are saying we are talking about factual knowledge the other person is talking about traditional folklore knowledge but to demean someone to shut down someone without understanding the truth of their upbringing and environment and life is not the way to go when we study this subject everybody believes in different things everybody has different values the true idea of this subject is having an open mind and critically thinking why did someone say what they say what do they mean by it and genuinely being interested in understanding the differences and the similarities right i mean like i said you all can go on with the superstitions you can go on with the myths that would not end and very beautifully you all have actually given those two answers of the fact and the superstition fact and a myth you know the difference but the but the fact that we need to accept and understand people and where they come from is a critical area of this subject dear listeners i'll show you the next slide and i think a few of you if not all would be aware of the character that i'm going to show you is it visible to all does anyone recognize this character somebody anybody do you all recognize this character excellent anandita gloria yes yes right a lot of you lot of you in capital letters excellent excellent lovely yes yes i i i love gloria too nice very nice so dear listeners for those of you who don't know this is a english show that i'm talking about called modern family a lot of listeners have already written that in the chat lovely and this character's name is called gloria she is not a native english speaker but the family that she is married to right now are from the us and they are native english speakers so of course while she communicates in english with her current family she is originally from colombia and she is living in us with her uh, partner and other extended family members while she communicates with them she has a very different accent and a lot of time she may not understand a few things subtle things that they say at one time she was having a discussion and an argument with somebody from her family her partner or someone right and then she says as you can see in the slide do you know how frustrating it is to have to translate everything in my head before i say it do you know how smart i am in spanish and i think that just hit the nail for me in my cross cultural psychology class this is something a reference that i have shown in my cross cultural psychology class at flame when we talk to somebody whose native language is not the one that you and i are speaking in and we judge them based on what we are speaking do we realize that does this person actually speak this language or are they actually making an effort at this stage to learn the language let me give you an example 
for example i don't know how to speak in chinese right but i get an opportunity that i can go and do a two year scholarship in china in a great prestigious college <coughs> they tell me moitri but the only catch is that you have to learn how to speak in chinese i try my best i learn try to learn somehow of course i cannot be as fluent as people whose first language is chinese and the ones who have been there for the longest time but i try to learn and then i go there and a lot of times i find myself being misunderstood i find myself being made fun of i find myself having to repeat a lot of times what i'm trying to say and probably being the butt of joke sometimes and then one day i get angry and i say just because i don't know how to speak well in chinese you all make fun of me do you even know how smart i am in english right it is the same logic dear listeners where gloria tells her family members who are english native speakers do you know how smart i am in spanish think of you and me in any situation where you are speaking a language which is not your first language and then if you get so angry and tell people imagine me telling people do you know how smart i am in english is just that i am not fluent with chinese so i may not come across as quote and quote as smart and as intellectual as i actually am and that's where my dear listeners we need to understand that language cross cultural communication is so important it can be a bridge for solving problems or it can be an entire bridge of problems what people say the way they say how long they pause pause what is the tone what is the accent when they are saying it along with the visible facial expressions communicate a lot based on what people are saying and the culture they come from there have been so many studies done that explain that it's very important to know cross cultural communication especially when you are sitting in a meeting in a board meeting where people are from different countries because you got to know how to greet them what does decency mean in their culture probably in your culture if you went for a meeting with some seniors you would think it's okay to touch their feet if there are japanese people in the same meeting and you touch their feet they would be like okay what's this we are not aware of it so you got to know what is appropriate what is accepted and what is understood and normalized in someone else's culture when you are communicating communication can be a barrier can be a solution based on your awareness and your knowledge of the other culture right i had to put this slide because this is something i always put in my class and my students enjoy it so i knew i had to put this for the webinar and there are so many shows where you understand that how non native english speakers are targeted and made fun of at the butt of jokes because they don't speak as fluently or as well as the other characters why because they come from a different place so this understanding becomes very very crucial in our cross cultural classes and this is primarily what the next slide would be about the values and attitudes right the value that you have the attitude that you hold before when you do anything when you believe in anything is so important a lot of times you would hear people saying the entire issue of lgbtqia is so gen z the entire save your planet is so gen z the entire work life pan you know balance is so gen z in my time we used to work 9 to 9 we used to work 12 to 12 which means that they are talking about a cross generational value they would say aapke dada par dada ke time pe to they used to work 13 hours without complaint now if you all work 8 hours without break you all are all getting up and protesting what does it mean what is environment environment too much what is this extra natak some people would say in our time we didn't have all that this an extra mental health mental well being in our time we were all fine this cross generational differences in values cross intergenerational understanding of values that people have becomes very important in understanding cultures because cultural factors play a huge role look at the last statement dear students gen z is a digitally sophisticated generation that values its unique identity and diversity and because of this there are too much dirt sometimes being thrown on gen z this population is not serious this population does not care about their future i would say if anything this population is the one that's trying to undo all the mess we created for the longest time correct look at this slide if you can see you can see people in a parade you can see greta thunberg 
talking about environmental protest you can see work life balance and you can see people carrying a uh, cardboard saying planet over profit the values that people nowadays and more so gen z values these are the factors that really drive our living system today sustainable living letting people live the way they are there are too many cases on lgbtqi plus rights and our government and our courts are still deciding over many factors legalization of same sex marriages giving equal rights right work life balance and the policy change in workplaces how this happens culturally how this happens intergenerationally it's very important you would hear news that in some countries same sex marriage has been legalized in some country abortion is not allowed in other country it is allowed and differences like these it not just tells us about the people there but it also tells us about cultural factors that drive policies that drive policies for legalization of lgbtqi plus rights policies for the work life balance policies for environmental sustainability how culturally these important factors drive us is very important what you and i value may not be something that somebody in other culture values but it's important to understand how these different policies and cultural factors across these values drive laws and legalizations in courts and legislative buildings my final not too final but closing to the end idea about stereotypes if yes, somebody had their hand raised should we take the question at the end sunilesh yes ma'am we can take the questions at the end okay great we have a poll coming up now i'm looking to looking at your responses already the poll is live now excellent very good right gen z are not serious about their careers it's a stereotype gen z are people born between 1996 to 2010 it's a fact the years may be plus 1 minus 1 i may have written plus 1 minus 1 year here and there but that's a fact between the generational age gap right so that is a fact and the first one is a stereotype the idea dear listeners of what facts are and what stereotypes are has been excellently displayed by you through this short poll why stereotypes are harmful right i meet two people or i meet three people and i speak to them who are currently in their let's say class 5 and 6 or class 10 11 and they tell me something about their future and they say that you know they don't care how their future is how it looks like or whatever and then i go and tell people you know what gen z is not serious about their careers they don't care my conversation based on 2 10 20 30 people does not give me the right to go and generalize and form a label about a complete population with no solid facts on my hand same thing that happens when we say that indians are like this americans are like this chinese are like that egyptians are like this people from kazakhstan are like that and so on and so forth stereotypes make our lives easier because you don't have to use your head to make rational judgment you can quickly label anything based on your choice based on your one or two interaction or based on something you have seen on an account of once or twice or thrice but is it the fact no if right now i'm sitting on a webinar with you right and then i tell uh, and then i can see that 8 9 10 of you or all of you are extremely enthusiastic and i'm loving it and i'll go and tell my other colleagues you know whenever you have a webinar you're always going to find such people who are supremely enthusiastic and i generalize this idea may not be true this factors would depend on what you are teaching how your whatever you are conveying is taken by you all the you know two way communication so many factors determine how a session goes 
but without judging without having a proper rational information or logical thought to why something has happened the way it has happened for us to say gen z are like that indians are like that only oh you don't know people from pakistan wo to aise hi hai these harmful stereotypes can completely wash away our logic and does not give us scope for rational thinking dear listeners and it is so dangerous you can look at the last statement stereotypical beliefs such as gen z are not serious about the future or interracial marriages are less stable than same race marriages we have all the statistics we have the divorce rates we have the rates for domestic abuse across and the facts say nothing based on what these two statements are because you have had few instances you have heard few stories you have met few people who were not serious or whose marriage did not last does not mean you can go out and form a stereotype and label it which most of us do because like i said easier to label than to think and that is what happens when you are looking at cross cultural signs and you try to question and critically think before forming a label right very very important uh there could be a few career counselors here who are uh, you know looking at uh, their career counseling sessions helping students which is primarily their uh, work their job description a few tips a few quick tips you know before ending the session would be the few four factors that you can see here bias awareness new information and the best choice for students like i kept saying about our personal biases that we may have how quickly we are to label how quickly we are to stereotype and generalize based on our encounters it's very important that when we are career counseling and helping students choose their colleges that we keep in mind that the most important factor is the interest of the students we may have had some good experiences or bad experiences with certain institutions with certain colleges and universities and it can be our duty to tell the student about it but to make sure that we are not biased we to make sure that we don't color our judgment or the student's judgment based on our experiences because the main goal for us when we help students is to make sure that we are aware of all the opportunities any new information coming up in the educational ground we are completely aware and up to the time and whatever biases personal biases that we may have or favoritism or hatred towards one or the other college or university is kept at bay and the student can take their decision we are here to guide them with all the information and then they can judge what they want to do there is an interesting poll here which i think it's very simple because i already discussed half of it i'm sorry i forgot the poll was supposed to be i think before it came but sunilesh no worries please send the poll yeah yes ma'am it is live now yeah 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 go ahead go ahead i already discussed half of it but i'm still excited to see what you all have to say about it excellent excellent absolutely absolutely students best interest are a top priority while helping them select colleges one should be wary of personal biases inaccurate judgments favoritism and dislike towards any college or university when helping them select colleges or places of higher education absolutely right very very important we all have our biases listeners we all have our biases we can't really undo with them but what we can do is be aware of them and try our best not to let it dictate our every life decision choice or the advice that we give someone being aware of it is very very important to taking the step to solving it right read this take a minute read this and just see what you think of it along with the name game this is something i want you all to tell me in the next 5 10 minutes when we have the q and a the client says there is to the therapist there is no way you can understand how i feel you are white you come from a societally higher race and i am black and you have never been discriminated for your race so you will never understand how i feel the pain i have the therapist who's a culturally sensitive therapist says you are right i don't know how to be discriminated against race but we are similar in another aspect because i have been discriminated based on my religion and i have had the experience of being persecuted over religion 
So while we are different in terms of race and religion, I know how that pain must feel. So while we are different on those aspects, we are similar in a different aspect. When you go to somebody, when you go to a therapist, right? And this is a very, this is a classic example of a cross-culturally relevant therapy session. Your therapist does not have likely experienced all your problems, but we still go to them. Because while they have not experienced all our life problems, they would have experienced different problems. And with that information and knowledge, they can help us. This therapist who's culturally sensitive says, I have not been discriminated based on my color of my skin, but I have been discriminated based on my religion. So I know how it is like to be outcast, how it is like to be discriminated and pushed aside. I know how that pain feels. And this can only be said by someone who's cross-culturally aware of the differences and the similarities that people from two different worlds share. This critically thinking therapist has really come to an understanding of the white client and bought out a common ground, right? A clear case of beautiful critical thinking. Lastly, what to do, right? You'll be like, Moitri, you shared a lot of this, a lot of that. But what do we do, right? I mean, we all have our biases. I still hold my stereotypes. I'm certainly not a person who does not have a stereotype. So what do we do, Moitri? You can start by having an open mind. You can start by questioning everything you hear rather than accepting it at the face value. Someone says, this person, people of that community, people of that culture are X, Y, Z. You listen to them, you say, okay, and then you try to understand why did they say the what they say? Was it because of their bad experience? Did it because they heard it from someone? Don't accept things right up front without thinking for yourself, without questioning it. The idea that what I think is the final thought and what anybody else has to think I don't care does not work. You, we have moved from the slides of myth and superstition and values and prejudice and stereotype. By now you know that no two people are alike. You already knew that. But now you also know that before you question and demean someone, you got to understand where they are coming from. Their source of knowledge, their privilege, their type, their culture, their country, and whole seas of difference before you pinpoint and put a label. Think critically for yourself rather than just listening and accepting what people have to say. Question something if you don't agree with it. Know that your truth is not everybody's truth and it is okay as long as it does not harm you or anybody else. As long as it does not harm you or anybody else. That's very important. We can have our differences, but if my differences is encroaching on your comfort and on your privacy, then that's a thing to question. Differences are okay, but my differences should not hamper your life and vice versa. Lastly, be kind. We will never know all the answers, dear listeners. We will never know. There's at this time giving you this webinar session when there is global violence. Manipur has been on fire for the last 50 days. We, our government has not been able to find the peace troops for the same. While I don't want to go into the political situation, but do know that there is global violence. There is war going on. What happened in Afghanistan? What's still happening in many countries? We are living in times of political and human turmoil, and it's only seemingly getting worse. So just be kind, because we will not have all the answers, but I think being kind and compassionate does go a very, very long way, right? It goes a very, very long way, dear listeners. So be kind and compassionate. At the end of the day, that will always be a positive step, even when you don't know what to do. This is something that Sunilesh would, you know, send it to you all over the chat. Uh, or Oprah probably mail it to you all for the ones who are in the session and you can mix and match what are the social graces accepted in which country. This is also something I put it out in with my cross-cultural psychology class and I tell my students go read and see what is accepted where and do mix and match, you know, match the following you are having school probably. Which country, what is accepted, which social grace is accepted in which country. So you can probably do it after the session and see if you've gotten right or what you've gotten wrong, and then you can read up about it. It's an interesting tickling your brain activity that I wanted you all to do, and you can do it later. Correct? Uh, it will be mailed to you all. Yes, ma'am. We can uh, share it with all the participants after the webinar. 
absolutely absolutely do we have the last poll left sunile yes ma'am which i'll be launching yeah. right now yeah this is the last slide and the last poll yes the poll is live now excellent thank you sunilesh most welcome ma'am excellent excellent critical thinking is the core of cross cultural psychology our beliefs and judgments about people are always correct no they hardly are they are not always correct beautifully said beautifully you know pulled out by the participants my way or the highway does not work having an open mind critically thinking questioning before accepting and being kind along the way is very very important these are the three screenshots that i put here because i wanted you all to go back and just do a google search you will get all of it you can google search i can send you all the ppt not to worry this ppt can be mailed to you all for all those who are interested you can go back look back read up on them and see what you agreed with what you did not agree with we can then have a healthy debate sometime you know i always tell my students please don't agree with what i am saying if you agree with something okay if you don't agree let's have a healthy debate and chat let's know where the differences are and why we are saying what we are saying correct so this will be given to you you can then go back and see what the myths about india are what the myths that shape americans thinking and what are the eight period myths you can go back google it the ppt will be with you and you can see if you agree with those myths if you don't agree why why not can all be then discussed you'll have my email id and we can all do it you know have a beautiful discussion later and that my dear listeners brings me to the end of my today's presentation this is technically my last slide which says thank you in different languages probably other than two three languages i don't know what are the languages that you know they thank you is written in but i thought that was a beautiful end to a cross cultural session with you all so thank you right a lot of you may know the languages where the thank you is written so that will be great and i had an absolutely great time uh, speaking to you and now up for the q and a's yes firstly thank you so much ma'am i think the last one hour has been very insightful and the listeners will surely agree to me uh, coming to the question answers ma'am uh, we have one question uh, it says anonymous attendee uh, i'm reading it out ma'am is it called cross cultural differences even if you are living in the same city and have differences in opinions or does geography matters in this concept geography excellent question my dear student excellent question whoever that uh, you know i'm guessing it's a student or somebody else geography of course matters a lot because when i'm talking about two states two countries geography is very important but there are differences between people living in the same state and two different parts so those are differences in opinions those are differences in understanding but right now when i'm talking about cross cultural the main focus has been on geography that's why two cultures two states right there are cultural differences between the same family members staying in slightly farther geographical locations in the same state so the cross cultural study goes sub cultural and sub to sub cultural the studying between differences just don't end students you know it just doesn't end and that's the beauty of the subject but when i gave this lecture the primary focus was on understanding differences geographically right like up kerala assam and of course east and west and the countries uh, for that matter that's uh, the second question says how do you think cross cultural marriages affect how a culture last during globalization how does it affect the children of these marriages how does cross cultural marriages affect our, affect how our culture lasts during globalization so see beautiful question again when we are talking about cross cultural relationships right i don't think anything can be looked at in silo while we are talking about a culture like for example take any family where the mother is from one state the father is from another state the siblings are from 10 different states so this kind of a absolute mix absolute cocktail level of cultures is on a complete rise in this globalized world 
because the world is a small global village now. A lot of times when you ask people which country or which state you're from, I'll tell you, they take offense. They say, I'm from the world. I don't think I need to be bounded or limited by geographical boundaries. It matters only in my passport. It doesn't matter for me as a human. So whoever asked this question, very beautiful question. And it's important to know that these cross-cultural relationships, be it marriage or not a marriage, of course, marriage for legal purposes, it's on the rise in this global world where people are now claiming their own religion, claiming their own beliefs, and letting go of many, many heteronormative practices and systems, one of which is the institution of marriage. I hope it answers your question somehow. Uh, I would uh, request all participants to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A uh, option and not the chat window because it becomes a little difficult to uh, tally both. It's a kind request. Difference in... Yeah. So, ma'am, we have another question. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, would you say difference in opinion, thoughts, etc., is only across generations or within Gen Z too? And how do you think this affects the development of our generations? Of course, differences in opinions, thoughts, it's across generations and within Gen Z and within every generation. So, people who are right now, let's say us as late millennials, and early Gen Z, for you, example, you all, there are differences in thoughts, values, and opinion between everything that we have grown up in. Correct. Because we are conditioned to believe the societal values of the time we grew up in. The time I grew up in, it was very, very important for me to have certain practices in my family, in my society, in my environment, if I wanted to be considered an in-group, if I wanted to be considered an insider. But now the entire point of insider does not matter. People are not People don't mind now standing out and being different. So the differences in values and opinions and thoughts is there across generations and within generations, within millennial, within generation alpha, beta, that is after generation uh, Z, right? Within baby boomers. And this is all because of how they were conditioned, the resources they grew up with, and what the society made them or told them to believe at that time. Yeah, next question. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the next question says, uh, there seems to be a lot of stigmas of people regarding other people of different cultures. Mm -hmm. Do you think the thought process of these people can be changed or when working together in a group, when these ideologies clash, how can a common ground be reached? Like I said, right? Ideology clashes will always be there. My last slide, what to do? No, it's easier to write than to actually believe in it, than to actually execute it. There will always be differences. There will always be my group is better than your group. My value is better than your value. My belief is actually the right belief. Yours is not. In that way, to actually, the common ground can be reached when you and me as individuals will actually believe that my thoughts are not always right. My way is not always the highway. I ought to have understanding between what the differences are and what the different similarities can be. There is going to be differences between the way people think, the way people behave. Before rejecting someone, before saying, mine, I come from a superior ground, you come from an inferior ground, the idea of being kind, compassionate, and accepting people for who they are, which sounds like a cliche, right? But that's where it starts. When you actually think that, no, probably what I have been made to think my entire life is not right. Probably I actually have some thoughts and they need to be questioned too. Maybe I was made to wrongly believe. Maybe I falsely labeled this group or this community. Can I take a step back and think, how many of you have had group projects and never had a fight? Very few. Same class, same citizens, a group project of 10 marks. Five people are working. Forget culture and race and ethnicity. <laughs> Very few people can actually sit successfully for a group project because there will be clash. But at some level, you have to negotiate between the differences and accept without, you know, questioning the other person. Yeah, next question. Yes. So, uh, Swarnika asks, uh, what is cultural appropriation in the context of cross-cultural psychology? Okay. Cultural appropriation would mean using a cultural product, a cultural entity, a cultural value for the sake of your entertainment for the sake of your joy without actually giving it the respect that it deserves, right? 
for example, if I talk about cultural appropriation, it would be when you watch Met Gala, right? When you watch Met Gala, and let's say there was one, forget Met Gala, a lot of you would know about Met Gala. There was, there's an actress called Sara Ali Khan. She did a shoot sometime in uh, South Africa, right? And she was wearing one of the attires of the South African community. And in that picture, behind her was a man, was a South African man, carrying a dagger or one of their iconic uh, instruments. That man who's nowhere in the picture, whose actual community is South African, who actually ought to be publicized, is not. Somebody else is publicized in that ground with no so, with no so ever understanding history or respect to that culture just because that gown had to be shot. When you use cultural entities, when you use cultural products with no respect, awareness or information, just for the sake of your entertainment purpose, it is the idea of cultural appropriation. You can actually go back and type Sara Ali Khan cover shoot woke and the entire cultural appropriation article will come up. It is absolutely brilliant question. Thank you, Swarnika, for asking so. I'll send you, a, I'll, for those of you who are interested, I'll send you a very interesting article on cultural appropriation too. Yeah, next question. Yes. I'm moving on to the next. Uh, Varij asks, uh, I am new to the subject psychology and this is my first time knowing concepts of psychology and it was interesting. I have a doubt that what is the impact of psychology as a whole? Does it help to make the world a better place to live in? I want to know how. I think so most of them have this question in mind. Right. Oh God, thank you so much for asking. I'm so glad that you're new and I hope, I truly hope that the session was worth your time, you know. How psychology helps to make this place a better, makes the world a better place. Forget cross-cultural psychology. The main idea, if you ask anybody what psychology is, is trying to understand the human behavior, is trying to understand why people do what they do. In today's time, you see, uh, whoever has asked this last question, in today's time, when there is a India, particularly in India, an alarming statistic of mental illness, an alarming statistic of mental disorders and mental imbalance, stress, and everything that deteriorates mental well-being. It is this field of psychology that tries its best day in and day out to help understand why this is so, help people with the concept of therapy, help people with the concept of medication, help people with the concept of qualified exercises to deal with the problems. It's become almost a passe to say that, oh yeah, everyone has depression and anxiety, but do we know the life-threatening effects of these diseases, of these illness? The world today, you can see what the WHO statistics has said. India is on the top five, top two country for mental illness. Mm -hmm. People are stressed. There is mental imbalance at an alarming rate and it's only going to be getting higher by 2030, 2040. And there's be no end. Then a subject like psychology, a field like psychology comes and tries to do its best through qualified, licensed, certified therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist by researching on what better policies can be included in schools and workplaces by researching on how can we actually help the generations that are coming and the current generations and the older generations to live a comparatively stress-free life. We can't take away all the stress, right? It's only idealistic and in a utopian world, can you take away all the stress? But how can we reduce the stress level? How can we increase the positivity? Subjects like positive psychology, subjects like cross-cultural psychology, social psychology will help you understand people. These researches done help in building policies, in building laws. And of course, you always have the psychotherapist, psychologist, and psychiatrist who help people with mental illnesses, who help people with when you just want to go talk, it's been a rough day, you want to talk to someone, go to a psychologist. They will help you find the meaning in the mess that you have. So the relevance of psychology, if not today, I don't know when it couldn't have been more significant. Not just because I'm in the field, but anybody who understands what the human mind is dealing with, the violence, the war, the crime that we see day in to day out. And people say, let's avoid the news. Let's avoid this. It's too much. It's getting too much. What is getting too much? The stress, mm -hmm. the negative news, the negative energy. And what do you do to deal with this? Because closing your eyes doesn't change the truth, but you right. can take a help from the right qualified individuals. And us working in the field of research, working in the field of teaching, 
in advocacy, in awareness, in education, and in therapy and psychiatry is trying a level best to make this extremely messy world not so messy. I hope that answers your question a little bit. That's on behalf of all my colleagues from psychology. Yeah. I'm sure that was a very helpful answer, ma'am. Uh, moving on to the next question we have, uh, how do we refer to Hindu epics as we do not know whether it is true, partially true, or are fictional? Do we call them myths, lores, or something else? Right. Wow. Excellent. Right. This Good is a question. question. <laughs> this is a question we hear a lot, actually. And I think Devdar Patnaik would be so happy if he knew that people are actually asking this question. It, it, it will, it will uh, depend on your source of knowledge, dear uh, you know, listener and question asker. Do you call it a myth? Do you call Ramayana and Mahabharata a myth? Do you call it a folklore? Do you call it stories of the legend, stories of superheroes? It will depend on your source of knowledge. And it would, this final answer to what you call them would come under the umbrella of mythology, would come under the umbrella of mythology, mythology, however you pronounce it. Because studies, right, have said that there was no actual truth or no basis in rationality when people have spoken about this uh, stone was lifted by Hanuman, that road in Sri Lanka was made by XYZ and that uh, character from Mahabharat. But people who have worked and written on this will use these characters to talk about everyday narratives. So what you call it is up to you. Until unless you are actually talking to someone who is an expert in mythology and then they will give you their explanation of what it is and why it is. That's why I said Devdat Patnayak, who is an expert in this area, will have his take. But if somebody else says that I don't believe in it, it's all nonsense. Before you actually start and get angry and say, how dare you? Ramayan has actually formed the basis of our, uh, you know, childhood and what we watch today. The entire uh, fight against the movie Adi Purush. A lot of you may be seeing the controversies, protests and ban in Nepal and ban in so many countries. That Adi Purush has wrongly depicted Ramayana. How can you insult Indian values? How can you insult Indian tradition? Ban the writer, ban the director, ban Adi Purush. Why? What does Indian culture and Indian value mean? Who are the people who are saying ban? Are you saying ban? Am I saying ban? Who are the ones they're saying ban? Why is it affecting them so much? Why is it affecting them so much that Ramayana is being depicted in a way which is not right? Why are they saying that XYZ's haircut is not right? In Ramayana days, no one wore this t-shirt. Because their source of knowledge and their source of value is so strongly entwined to Ramayana, which according to them has been wrongly depicted in Adi Purush, that they want to ban it all. So it depends on whom you're talking to and where their source of knowledge is coming from. Excellent question. Wonderful. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. This seems to be an interesting question. Ma'am, as you know, teens argue a lot with their parents. Most say it is because they're rebellious and argumentative or maybe even due to hormones. But the teens themselves think it is due to parents being wrong and not understanding them and that they have tried talking to them or another trusted adult about it. Uh, what is your take on this and how can it be solved? Mm, wow, very relevant, very, very apt, very relevant. Something that I have had parents come in my office at Flame and speak to me, something that I have spoken to students in my different meetings. First and foremost is something I'm going to tell you that you've already heard. Cross-generational gap. Generational gap right, is something that is very commonly heard. There are times when your children are trying to tell you something based on what they know and what they feel and they're trying to convey it to you and you may be unable to understand it because of where you come from. And you may compare it to a timekeeper. Even my parents were strict or even my caregivers were not like this, but I did it well. You can't be comparing your life and how you were with your family members to your child and how they are. You have to understand that two generations grew up with different resources, different time. This is a digitally born footprinted era. Their resources, their exposure, their awareness and information and knowledge is very different than what you or your family, the parents' family grew up with. There will always be differences in many a times between families of parents and children, especially teenagers, whatever you call them, right? Whatever the difference may be. But it's important to actually see and understand each other's point of view, which is very difficult, right? That's why the conflicts. 
but actually try to understand my children my child is trying to convey something to me where is my child coming from right my child is also born in a time or is there in a time where digital knowledge has exploded social media tiktok and what not the awareness exposure the what they know through their phones is something that you never had in your time so it's very possible that there are a lot of things you will not agree with but i'm going to go back to my last slide and say try having an open mind and see if there is some way you can find a middle ground because there has to be some response right conflicts are always going to be there some form of understood negotiation can only be come across between you and your child based on the relationship that you share with your child and of course it's also up to your children to see how much they can understand where you are coming from you may be saying don't do this don't do that because of reasons that you've already had past experiences but while it's important that we let our child experience life for themselves and make our make their own mistakes we also want to be careful and very there so that they don't step into the wrong scenes but at the same time we also got to give them autonomy and treat them the age group they are in so that they feel that my parents are caregivers and not watch keepers you know where the conflict comes so yeah basically finding a middle ground and having an open mind to understanding where both parties come from can be helpful so yes yes sunilesh yes ma'am uh okay clubbing these two questions very similar what is the difference between social psychology and cross cultural psychology and what are the implications of cross cultural psychology for areas such as education healthcare and workplace diversity excellent excellent difference between cross cultural and social psychology social psychology will tell you the similarities and differences between the social concepts that you see in society why people behave a certain way in groups what does you know biases in confirmation mean when we look at psychology there are more than 15 to 20 branches and every day there is a new branch that we mostly hear of social psychology will help you understand people's behavior in groups <clears throat> why people there are so many studies that have done that have done through experiments that show how people behave in group versus how people behave when they are single if you think of yourself and see how you behave in a classroom versus how you would behave if you were having a one to one tuition with me vis a vis now in a webinar this social behaviors this social aspects across our lives across the concepts theories that you talk about talks about social psychology social psychology and cross cultural psychology interesting difference is that cross cultural psychologists primary aim primary objective is to study behaviors similarities and differences mm -hmm. across two or more culture social psychology's main idea is not to understand the differences across two or more culture while that may be a part of it their idea is how to understand social confirmation social justice social prejudice how people behave in groups why what is the meaning of bystander effect why if there was an accident today 10 people are there nobody is coming forward to help because everybody is thinking the other person would help what is the idea of social loafing when you do a group project one two people always lag behind are baki sab kar lenge na so the problems and the benefits of working and staying in a society staying in groups and how does the group mindset function when someone says let's lead a protest the other person says you go you go i'll be behind you why does someone agree to lead something where they know the outcome will be disastrous and why are the people taking a back seat all these behaviors politically educationally and the social concepts is understood in social psychology while i said cross cultural psychology the crux is understanding the similarities differences the behaviors between two and more cultures the idea of culture becomes very very interesting and important in cross cultural psychology that's what the name is and what was the other part sunilesh <clears throat> uh, the implications yes, right yeah. implications of cross cultural psychology in education healthcare and workplace diversity absolutely excellent excellent question cross cultural psychology in workplace diversity today if i have you know look at all these people holding the thank yous think of all these people from different countries today i want to have a team to understand how stereotype works in 10 countries and i have got 10 people from 10 countries i need to understand how to communicate with each one of them i need to understand what their belief and value system is to be able to work properly with them and i need to finish up and tone up my cross cultural language so that i don't say anything that is offensive or that is mean 
workplace diversity is having people across different spaces, different cultures, different norms come to your team. And if you have the knowledge of cross-cultural information, cross-cultural psychology, you would know that accepting people means accepting differences. You would know that your thoughts about people are not right. Think if all these 15 people were in my team and all of them were, all the 15 people you see in the slider from different countries, how do you think I'll be able to successfully lead a cross-cultural team if I didn't have cross-cultural information, if I didn't know about their values, about their beliefs, about their communication system? So for that, cross-cultural information is very effective. Workplace, there are so many advertisements. The marketing psychology would tell you there are so many advertisements that works well in a country, but that does not well work well in another country. Why? Because of their value system. In India, when you see the advertisements, studies have shown that talk about old people, you will mostly see old people with a child, old people sitting in a rocking chair, and you will have ads like Zindagi ke saad bhi, Zindagi ke baad bhi, LIC, or some furniture ad, or some baby caring ad, because you associate older people with caregiving, with nurturing, like grandparents, LIC, you need life insurance for them. But in other country, the same ad would take offense because, and studies have shown, people would say, are you saying that just because I'm an old age, I'm not worth of anything more, but you know, a caretaker for grandkids? Are you saying I can't continue an occupation or a job because of my age? The same age, which is the same ad, which is seen as so loving and caring in India, would be misinterpreted as something else in another country based on their values and beliefs. And multiple studies have shown the same. An advertisement that works well in one country because of their values and beliefs. So you need to have cross-cultural knowledge and awareness ki where to say what based on the cultural place you're going to. When people go to Singapore, suddenly they're like, Arey, this is not India, don't throw garbage here, don't throw garbage there. Why? Because you'll be fined, you'll be jailed. Once you come to India, suddenly the behavior is different. Why? Are sab to kar rahe na? Suddenly you went to Singapore and you were actually spitting all around and throwing chewing gum. Maybe you'll not be in the webinar today. We don't know where you'll be. So having cross-cultural knowledge at work, at school, while dealing with people in healthcare, very important. The therapist and client example. If the therapist is not culturally sensitive, does not use culturally appropriate words, is not culturally aware, you think they'll be able to deal with a client who comes from a different place? Someone who's coming from a war-torn land, land of Afghanistan and has now taken refuge in a different country is going to the therapist. And the therapist is from, let's say, Bangladesh. Of course, there are cultural differences between the client and therapist. Somebody has come from a war-torn land of Afghanistan and this person is a therapist in Bangladesh. Until unless they hone up their information, awareness and knowledge, they will fail to give successful therapy to the client because they will not know the pain the client is coming from. So this cross-cultural psychology, other than the, all the domains that you mentioned, is applicable in every field that you can think of. Every field. Just go back, look at the slides that I have sent and see what I am saying. Think of one field where cross-cultural psychology may not be useful or important. It might be difficult to find. In every domain, it has its place. In every domain. And I hope that you come to my cross-cultural psychology class and I can give you details of it. I would love to. Yes, Anilesh. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a specific question to the uh, PPT. It says, could you please elaborate the difference between superstition and myths again and the yes. difference between generalization and stereotypes for clarification? Correct. Superstition is usually an idea that has an outcome. If you don't wear black, this would happen. If you don't wear blue, this would happen. The, this is a belief. Superstition usually is a belief. Myths come from the idea of mythologies, mythologies, folklore. It's a story. It's a story that you use to explain social events, that you use to have social narratives. For example, mental illness is a myth. And people say people who get mentally sick are actually possessed by demons. It's because somebody was angry with you from up above. And that's why you have this. In period menstruation, the story, the period myths are, if after eight o'clock you wash your hair, the genie comes because you're on your period. There is always a supernatural hero, a folklore legend, or a comparatively scary figure that is a path of 
mythological stories that form your myths myths are primarily stories superstition are primarily beliefs stereotype is when you generalize a set of your thoughts based on your events the generalization of thoughts based on your set of events from your one or two interaction with someone becomes stereotype i have spoken to eight of you in this webinar based on your chat and q and a and then i have generalized and said that okay, this is how uh, all uh, your voice is breaking connection webinars will be based on just one connection that i conducted today and stereotypes generally hi is it better now uh, yes ma'am it is uh, better now ma'am your voice was breaking in the last 30 seconds right right so stereotypes usually are negative connotation indians are this us people are that the connotations for stereotypes are usually negative in nature and when you form a common belief and when you generalize a set of beliefs to have an understanding that may not be true for a group of people or place or behavior it's called generalization it's called stereotype so generalization is a part of stereotype it is a process of stereotype okay i hope that's clear thank you ma'am uh, uh there's a question from kaushik uh, what is the most common strategy used for cross cultural communication could you give an example of the many strategies that are used for cross cultural communication negotiation usually works uh, best but again i wouldn't say best but a lot of studies that were done they have shown how negotiation seems to be very very effective while having cross cultural communication because when you are at a workplace and you understand that the other party i'm dealing with a group of japanese delegates who have come to flame right and i and i know that they have certain beliefs and values that are maybe very different or that i absolutely don't agree with but i have to come to a middle ground because we have to sign a document we have to sign an mou we have to sign a agreement what i can do is understand negotiate i should understand where they are coming from they should be able to understand where i am coming from it's a 50 50 journey for both ways from both cultures and then to negotiate and come to a common understanding right but this only happens when you are aware of the cultural information of the cultural processes of the other culture if, if i have zero knowledge about japanese culture the japanese delegates who are coming to claim or about how japanese when it comes to business when it comes to work and i don't know how japanese people function on work i would not be successful in the way i talk with them in the way i deal with them it's because i have to be aware and know how japanese people function at work what do they mean when they mean business why and what they say and everything about their culture as much as i can humanly understand only then will i be able to successfully negotiate because i also understand the culture they are coming from same with them they'll be able to successfully negotiate with us indians at flame if they understand where we are coming from and come to a middle ground so that it is a win win for both again many a times it may not be successful but this is one of the most effective strategies shown in many studies yes yes okay uh this happens to be the last question in the quiz q and a box uh this is from kalyani uh what are your thoughts on people saying that people who discuss and enforce topics like cross cultural psychology need to be more tolerant and not be over sensitive how can we convince them of the importance of the topic a very important wow. question wow kalyani lovely beautiful right i wish you were right here and i could see you then i would actually give you a applaud just like everyone else everyone else's question absolutely amazing you know in today's world kalyani you would know this probably a lot better than me that's why maybe the question if you say anything and if you happen to share your true feelings and thoughts with anyone they would say oh my god you're so sensitive oh my god you're over sensitive don't think too much stop overthinking these are some things you would commonly hear for the people who are saying a lot of all these how can you convince of course you and me both know that convincing anybody for anything is not easy or else our lives would be much easier <laughs> our personal and professional lives if we could successfully convince people but just telling them and speaking to them you know having an open conversation rather than us being defensive and putting our guards up when someone says oh more oh god mohit you look at you teach no wonder 
you need to be more tolerant you need to be more uh, you know sensitive you you don't understand what it means i think i can just help them by listening to them and by asking them what do you mean when you say this and why do you say what you say having an empathetic and genuinely being interested to listen to why they are saying what they are saying is a very good starting point that i have seen in my life and i'm sure so have most of you so i sorry can you just repeat the question again sunilesh yes ma'am the question was uh, what are your thoughts on people saying that people who discuss and enforce topics like cross cultural psychology need to be more tolerant and not be over sensitive how can we convince them of the importance of the topic right 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 need to be more tolerant right absolutely absolutely so when people sometimes you know what happens you and me would know people share sexist jokes racist jokes jokes on the lgbtqi plus community jokes on homophobia and then when we take offense they would tell me moitri you need to be more tolerant stop being so over sensitive but this is not tolerance this is taking offense against something that is offensive nowadays under offensiveness whenever people are speaking up a lot of others are saying oh god you are so touchy you are so over sensitive can't make a joke around you but when your jokes are racist sexist and problematic in nature the problem is not with how i react the problem is what you think and what you say so like i said how you asking how you can convince of course convincing anyone for anything is difficult but asking them what they mean by it telling them to give an example truly listening to them without having the intention to actually fight back or answer back to them and then probably talking to them and if after a point you see that nothing is happening it's not really worth spending your time and mental energy i would say because after a time you have to realize that your mental energy gets drained trying to convince people of something they would never agree you can do your best and then decide when the limit is set okay but yeah that's the answer yeah yes ma'am that's very uh, nice way to put it uh, okay i think this question has been answered ma'am how do professionals approach cross cultural communication you have answered this question yeah yeah i did yes. i did yes yes ma'am uh, we have answered uh, all questions thank you so much uh for your time uh we have spent half an hour for the question answer session and i'm sure all the questions have been answered thank you so much sunilesh thank you so much to all the listeners and thank you for moderating the session so beautifully and all my put the polls now put my polls then and eating your head and disturbing you but thank you to you and all the listeners what a pleasure it has been what a pleasure thank you thank you so much thank, thank you. you so much ma'am thank you to all the listeners as you mentioned you. uh i think they had a very insightful session and the questions also were uh very thought provoking and i'm sure they have taken home some good uh, uh thoughts and lessons from this uh session i hope so i hope so sunilesh thank you so much yes, for your thank you thank, thank you so much ma'am good day